Welcome to another episode. My name is Misha Bush, and today we're talking about how regenerative farming can be accelerated worldwide. We're talking about this with Dr. John Lundgren, who is an agroecologist with a PhD in entomology. He's the founder of the Blue Dasher Farm and the Agdisis Foundation. His research and education programs focus on assessing the ecological risks of pest management strategies and developing long-term solutions for regenerative food systems. He has written more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, and he's the author of the book, Relationships of Natural Enemies and Non-Prey Foods. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more interviews like this, consider subscribing to the channel. But right now, let's dive right into the interview with Dr. Lundgren. So, well, I, um, there's a lot of information, obviously, uh, at least on uh, regenerative agriculture uh, practices. Um, and I was, what I would like to do today is to focus a little bit on um, not so much like what are the, the things that need to happen. Obviously, more farmers need to switch to regenerative ag. More people need to start consuming regenerative agricultural produced products. Um, but I'm very interested in how can we make that happen and how, uh, what are perhaps the obstacles of um, limiting uh, the transition in terms of the speed that that needs to happen? Because obviously we don't have a lot of time left with, with problems that are uh, happening on, in the world uh, to our planet. So the, the sooner the better, I would uh, reason. Um, so I'm really, really interested in um, like maybe what's blocking that transition and how can we make that happen? Um, but before we start off with that, um, I was wondering uh, if I would start talking to a conventional farmer about regenerative agriculture, what do you think he or she is most likely to say? Um, right now, I think there's a lot of skepticism, right? I mean, the conventional farmers have been doing things the way they've been doing them for a long time. There's a lot of infrastructure that supports the messaging yeah. And there's a lot of fear of change, and and change is a scary thing. Um, so yeah, I think that they would be very skeptical. But at the same time, um, yeah, I've got some some farmers are helping me to rebuild our our uh, laboratory facility right now and expand it out. One of them is a conventional farmer and. He was very interested in what we were doing out here. He's like, well, you know, but those cover crops won't work in, in our systems up here. And I'm like, ah, well, you know, that's a, there's a lot of myths, right? And there's a lot of, I tried this without any support and I failed and therefore it must always fail. Right, and, right. Um, and so demonstrating how these systems work becomes really important. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's still a lot of misconception at the I moment. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in how a conventional farmer, obviously you look at it also from a scientific point of view, but if you look at a very basic level, what's the difference between how a conventional farmer looks at insects and the, let's say the microbiology in the soil and the way that you look at it? Um, conventional farmers don't look at insects at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, honestly, you know, until we started speaking about insects, um, at no-till meetings and, and, and sustainable ag meetings a number of years ago, insects really weren't on the radar screen. And so, you know, I mean, we didn't single-handedly drive this into the consciousness of the farming community, but I do, do think, you know, we were a part of, of this, you know, raising awareness of the insect apocalypse and things like that. And then not only that, but that, that insects are much more than just pests, you know? Yeah. Most farmers, I mean, they didn't, they don't go out and scout their fields. Uh, they, they, I mean, even though pests were the, the manifestation of the insect world in their lives, um, they, I, I mean, even still very few of them in our, in our part of the country actually went out and looked for them, right? right. Um, they would hire somebody maybe to do that, or, or they would just get on a calendar schedule and spray, you know, around early August, I saw the spray planes going, uh, and therefore I should probably uh, give the, the co-op a call and, and get our soybean fields sprayed right. um, without real knowledge of what was actually happening because it's costing them a lot of money to waste yeah. their money on sprays like that. 
Or they just buy packages, right? They just go down and buy a genetically modified crop with an insecticidal seed treatment and dang it, I don't have to think about it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is, is that something that happened uh, in parallel with the, the upcoming of these um, pesticides? Or how, how, how was it? What was, the, what was agriculture like before that? What do you mean? Like, uh, have, have farmers always have such an attitude toward insects? Or if we go back 100 years ago, or I'm not sure, maybe 150, 200, is that a period where, where farmers were much more in tune with nature and looking at how they could work together and, and have insects work for them, basically? Yeah, I think that there was probably a raise, or there was, there was more of a connection with the farms that they're farming, right? Um, uh, that they were actually getting their hands dirty out and, and their feet dirty by walking in their fields. Um, and, and there wasn't necessarily a, a real strong knowledge of insect ecology or where insects fit, but they did know when there was an outbreak going on and they didn't know what to do about it, right? Um, and so pesticides gave them that tool, but with technology that's poorly applied comes, comes complacency and um, very often in human society. And I think that that really accompanied what the rise of pesticides was uh, mm. in the US and around the world. Yeah. And what worries you the most about the current conventional agricultural system? Um, you know, uh, what worries me is, is the short time that we have, there's a real sense of urgency and you kind of highlighted that earlier, but you know, we've got 50 years of topsoil left and the FAO have pointed that out. But what nobody seems to talk about is that we're losing 10% of species every decade. And so right around when we lose all of the topsoil, we're also going to lose most of the life on planet Earth. Right. And um, so, yeah, there's, I mean, we got 20 years to turn this ship around, right? We've got to change agriculture in that time. Um because it so, could yeah. be that that's there's a, no, there's no life issue. left to uh, to rebuild the soil before right. it's right. completely degraded. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's pretty ominous, but it's also I mean there's a lot of hope, and that's where this regenerative ag kind of comes in. As man, there's some real opportunities here for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lately, I've been speaking to several people from within the regenerative agriculture community about how the transition from conventional to regenerative farming can be accelerated. This is something that I keep thinking about. And the answer, answer that I kept uh, uh, getting from different people was from these conversations, what it, that it needs to come up from the, that needs to come from the bottom up. So government won't help and the sector needs to really build it farm by farm, uh, brick by brick, let's say. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I worked within the federal system for many years and was a scientist there. And, but, and much of my science was devoted to kind of incremental changes, right? And driving incremental changes to our food system um, to make a broken system work. And then suddenly you wake up and you look around and you drive through the Midwest or the upper Great Plains of the US and it's two crop species. I mean, hundreds of miles of, of two species of plants and yeah. one species of livestock, and that's cattle. Um, so it became real clear that, you know, we've got to change this. And then simultaneously, I met um, farmers that were doing just that. And they were farming within this region, but they were doing things differently. They didn't need all the agrochemical inputs. And they didn't call themselves that at the time, but now they're known as the sort of you know, forebears of or forefathers of the uh, of the regenerative movement uh, that's going on right now. Yeah. Um, so science needs to change too, doesn't it? it it's not just about the um, the farming community that has to change, or consumers that have to change, or the medical industry that has to change. The scientific community has to change too, and and we need to apply science in a different approach. Um, yeah to kind of foster this macro evolutionary change in our food system. And that requires, yeah, grassroots scientists becoming connected to the problems that they're solving or trying to solve again. 
Yeah. And uh, so just like it's bottom up from the farming community, it's also bottom up from the from the scientific community. The change isn't going to happen from the big from the large uh, infrastructure. It's going to happen yeah. from little places like Ignisus. And that's why I quit when we got out. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a whole uh, in, very interesting story uh, by itself. Uh, your, your way um, uh, as first working for the government and now it's sort of uh, from the bottom up uh, rethinking the whole way you do science. Yeah. Um, is, is that is that do you, is it besides not helping is it a big obstacle for the transition to regenerative agriculture the the current uh, infrastructures and the current uh, government policies and things like that oh yeah for sure um you know policies that that you know don't that incentivize poor behaviors and and then uh put restrictions on on innovation are are pretty crippling yeah um Likewise, science that comes out that um, you know only focuses on on the current uh, uh, agricultural system um, doesn't provide a lot of resources for this new wave of regenerative farms. And then also science that that incorrectly characterizes regenerative farms gives a false perception of the potential. Right. Yeah. 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 So and, those are yeah those are main major hindrances. For sure, and what what, what would you see are the would you say are the biggest um, uh, factors? Sorry about that. Um, somebody <laughs> destroying the place there in the back. What would you say are the biggest factors that uh, uh, science can bring to the table to support regenerative agriculture and a transition to it? Well, right now we're focusing on two or three major areas. Um, Number one is that science needs to show, uh, it's very easy for you know, middle adopters of, of regenerative ag. You know, those early adopters you know, took a big bite real soon and, they, um, and, and they've gone this route, okay? They didn't need a lot of convincing. They, mm -hmm. they had something in their lives or in their hearts that said, this is the way to go. Um, middle adopters are a little bit more skeptical and understandably so. And, and so they might listen to some of these regenerative farmers who are real leaders and say, you know what, that may work there, but it'll never work over here. Yeah. And so science needs to be, it, it is a powerful tool for showing, you know, this is not just anecdotes, right? That you, when you go this route, when you adopt these practices driven by these principles, it always works. You can always predict to see this um, on your farm. And, and so we've been focusing really hard on validating some of these regenerative systems, um, cash grain systems, uh, corn in the US is king. So we wanted to make sure we hit that one early. Almonds, we're just finishing that study up. Um, rangelands in the, um, around the country. Right. And, uh, and then the other thing that science needs to be doing, um, I think, is 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 focusing on um, helping that transition. Um, you know, how do you get there? Because we're studying to validate this, we're studying established successful farms, best management practices as defined by the farmers themselves. Yeah. Um, but uh, the uh, the question that we get the most is, oh, that sounds great, but how do I get there from a conventional farm? And so we can use science to help that transition, right? right. We, can, we can examine different strategies that farmers are employing and, um, and develop roadmaps that'll get you there as quick as possible with as little pain as possible. Cool. And, and how is that information currently transferred to the farmers? Like you, you're doing the research, there's the results, and how, how does a farmer get get a, uh, a hand of that? Yeah, great, great question. Um, the answer is that it's not done as well as we'd like it to be. All of our, uh, all of our science is open access and we make sure that we post it on our websites and on Facebook and Twitter um, feeds and things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, we rely on the farming community in order to uh, 
uh, help us to disseminate this information. And, right. and so podcasts or YouTube videos and things like that are really powerful tools for us too. Yeah, great. Um, well, you already talked a bit about, about the obstacles, um, such as government policies that are not promoting it. Uh, what do you see? Are there any other like main obstacles that are blocking the transition to regenerative farming? Oh, uh, farm insurance, probably. That's a big one. So, but that's another policy angle. Um, yeah. Really stifles innovation. Um, the, the, the scientific questions that I pointed out, those are some important ones for, for trying to um, overcome it. A lot of this is cultural, though, too. And so we can, we can provide data until we're blue in the face, but it doesn't necessarily, if the farmers don't trust you and you don't have a relationship with farm air, farmers or speak their language, then you may as well be flushing that data down the toilet. I mean, it's not going to help. Um, right. And so that's one of the big pushes that we have at Ecdysis Foundation. And one of the ways that I feel like we're different is that, you know, we, we have to be farmers. Uh, scientists have to actually walk the talk. They can't just get up there and say, and, and, uh, you know, spew out the, uh, the, what the science says about best management practices or what you should be doing on your farm as the expert, I'm here to advise you. No, 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 that doesn't work, right? Yeah. Um, doesn't go well with the farmer, probably. That doesn't go well, yeah. And, it, and it's so disconnected that the validity of it is probably somewhat questionable, too. Yeah. So yeah, we, we try to make our the scientists a part of that food community again. That's part of our vision for how we conduct our work. Right. And do you see any, like, I also hear from you, it's a, it's a process that that's, it's being in the trenches almost, uh, build it farm by farm, research publication by publication, uh, try to get the message across do you see yeah. any any things that that you think that can be done that can happen to kind of accelerate the uh the shift um boy it's accelerating really fast right now um right. so yeah i mean i think there's a snowball effect that's going on and so i don't know what faster looks like <laughs> but i yeah. And I don't know, you know, at what point do you, is it too fast almost, but where we get put the cart before the horse a little bit, because a lot of times we're shooting from the hip here, right? Uh, there, things are changing so quickly that it, it, yeah, we're science, for example, is just trying to catch up with what the farmers are doing out there. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you, you see in the farming community that is definitely uh, picking up a lot of pace and uh, and speeding up. Do, how do you how do you look at that from a consumer point of view? Because on one hand you have the supply, you would also have need to have at least to a certain extent it would be good to have a a big demand for on the consumer side and and obviously there is. Um, but I think if I look at mainstream media, the average person probably doesn't know what regenerative farming is. At least when I look at the area that I'm in, north north uh, western Europe. H how do you look at that? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, most people don't know what regenerative is, but more and more people have heard the name. And there's large corporations, places like General Mills, Cargill in the U.S., that are are major buyers of uh, and and they're using this as part of their marketing now. Um, that they want to be the, the regenerative companies that are, you know, not just <clears throat> uh, growing food, but helping to save the planet while they do it. Um, right. So I think that that awareness is going to be rapidly increasing. Um, you know, I don't know that there needs to be a financial incentive. Uh, it'd be wonderful if there was, but at the end of the day, these regenerative farms are, are need to be as profitable, if not more profitable than conventional farms in order for this to really take and proliferate. Yeah. And, and we're, our data is showing that invariably they are. 
um, at least twice as profitable for various reasons. So um, that's going to help drive producers down that road um, without any incentive programs. But you know, if there's if there's perceived risks or something like that, then an incentive program that could help drive that change to getting a successful system. I, I think that that's that that's okay, just as long as we don't lose sight to, or or just develop another you know check writing program to to float the farmers. Right, right. Yeah. So so regenerative ag really needs to be a complete replacement of conventional and not a sort of superfood niche type of uh, a product in the at least from a offer point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And and you already talked a bit about some bigger companies that are jumping into this uh well for them obviously it's an opportunity and there and I'm sure there's some, some honest uh, motivation in like about try to save the planet, which they're then marketing. Um, you did see like the big fossil fuel companies that have been blocking uh, clean energy, uh, solar, wind for quite a long time before they suddenly started to jump into it when they saw the momentum was sort of shifting towards that. Do you think a similar thing is already happening or might be happening in the uh, regenerative ag uh, sector? Yeah, I think that they, I think there's a real opportunity. So there's an incentive for being regenerative right now. <laughs> and, the, and that may be perceptive. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, regardless, um, if you're a regenerative farmer, you're seen as being good. And, yeah. um, and so they're, uh, but the, the question becomes, and we're in a very dangerous situation right now. <clears throat> Um, you know, what is a, re what is regenerative agriculture? Um, and, and, and there's been some efforts to define it, right? But none of those efforts actually help me. I just, when I walk onto a farm to know whether this farm is regenerative or not, right? Yeah. Um, and so we've been, we just, we just published a paper. It should be out and uh, visible here in the next week or two um, where we, actually put some data behind um, a, an approach for defining what a regenerative farm is versus a conventional farm. And I hope that that helps us to guide the dialogue, especially with the new administration kind of coming in and there being a lot of interest in things like carbon farming and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Could you give us a small insight into the upcoming paper or is that still classified? Yeah. Like what's, what's one of the main metrics that you would use to, to classify uh, a regenerative farm? Um, so we ask a few simple questions. So there is a couple of or options for farmers that, you know, uh, develop, you know, basically a scoring of different, of different practices, right? And, and it's a little dangerous because, you know, you don't want, you want the practices that you're scoring here to reflect the principles of regenerative, not just, and, and it not become just about the practices themselves. Right. Um, yeah. And we saw that with organic or, or sometimes we see that with organic is that it becomes so focused on the practices that you can attain a really damaging food system that's certified organic in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's opportunities there in the regenerative sphere. There's a few uh, options as far as, you know, but they're completely non-functional. One of these surveys of are you regenerative or not is like 52 pages long. What farmer in their right mind would ever go through that process, let alone have the time to do it? And so we approach this thinking about it, um, balancing um the function with precision right we want to accurately describe what a regenerative farm is and distinguish it from a conventional farm but right. we don't uh we don't want it so complicated that nobody can use it right for sure and so we we assembled a few uh, like 10 questions different ones for cropland and rangeland and uh they're simple they're yes and no and 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 then we measured this on, geez, probably more than, I'll bet it was close to a hundred farms 
across the country and we did full site inventories or at least yeah we have measured all kinds of different things on these farms right from soil carbon water relationships to soil micronutrients soil microbiology soil health um, plant communities inverts uh, uh, economics yields nutrient density all of these different metrics and I'll be damned, but that matrix, you know, this, the number of practices increases, you see direct linear relationships with increases in all of these regenerative outcomes. Really? And so the, the matrix really works. And could this lead to uh, like a, a label or a certification? Is that I something? guess, you know, we're not, we're not big advocates for labels, but, uh, yeah. but yes, the answer is yes you can categorize regenerative versus conventional farms. What was interesting is that as farmers sort of start to increase, you know, it's a, uh, the number of regenerative practices on their operation, these being things like no-till, ground covers, never leave bare soil, um, plant diversity, um, livestock integration, compost, compost teas, uh, and then abandoning agrochemical use. Um, right as they start to increase the number of practices on their operation, we end up seeing sort of two clouds of data. Um, and, and these are in established systems. And what they mean is that just adopting a couple of regenerative practices doesn't work. Uh, you don't survive for very long as a farm. You either have to go one of two routes, either you go regenerative or you go conventional. Right. Um, because staying in the middle, you, you're not able to keep that system running. Right. Um, it's going to be half regenerative. Right. And so I think that that really aids us in advising farmers in how to adopt a regenerative system is, you know, you probably need to adopt a system, not just put a toe in with no-till or, or, you know, maybe just integrate, you know, a rye cover crop this year. Um, you can do it that way you aren't going to be as successful and you're not going to be around for very long unless, unless you're able to attain that higher level. Right. So it would probably be better for a farmer to say, I'm going to like have a sort of test plot on my land where I go completely regenerative as right. opposed to saying, I'm going to add a few aspects to my whole uh, property. Yeah, I think that that's true. Um, you know, I mean, most most large corporations, in order to keep current and on top of things and be a leader in their field, they devote five, ten percent to R and D. And farmers, are, farms are a business. They should be doing the same thing, uh, yeah. doing something wacko on their farm that might just end up leading to something that nobody ever thought could happen. Right. Yeah. 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 That, that's that's. Uh, I really. Uh, I'm very interested in the research you you uh, described. Uh, is it, is it also going to be published on your website? Yeah, it'll be published um, online at F1000 Research um, here. And yeah, it should be publicly available very soon. Okay. So Perfect. It's just at the typesetters now. Cool. I have a few. Yeah, and then we'll promote it. So you'll see it. Oh, great. Yeah, great, great. I'll keep an eye out. I have a few concluding questions. Um, I was wondering how big do you estimate the chance? And I've actually... Uh, asked it to to uh, uh, Charles Massey from Australia. He uh, didn't want to give me a, a number, so I'm curious what you're going to say. But how big do you estimate the chance that humanity can actually pull it off and, and fix the damage that we have created before it's too late? And obviously, specifically when it comes to our soil and regenerating it. Um, well, I think there's a there's 100% chance. Um, we don't have a choice, first off. Um, we've got to be changing the way that we, that we farm. Um, not all of us are going to be around. We're met living through a massive evolutionary event right now, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and we're selecting for the smart survivors, the strong survivors. Uh, and that ain't pretty. Evolution isn't a pretty thing, right? Um, but there we are, and, and there are going to be some people that are trying to help. And, and we've positioned ourselves somewhat uniquely um, to, to try to help as many farmers get to that higher plane than, than in time. 
so that we can stave off massive catastrophe. Right. And do you foresee a different sort of society in that way? More people working on the land, yeah. moving away There's from the city. There's going to be much more connection to the land now. Great. Um, yeah, we were driving. One of my my scientists here at Ecdysis was driving. We were driving together, and he pointed at this field that was not too far from his from his farm. And he um, and he's like, that field right there. Um, it was plowed two times this spring. It was uh, then it was sprayed with herbicides. Mm -hmm. It was planted. It was sprayed again. And uh, then they sprayed fungicide and insecticide. They harvested it and then they plowed it again. <laughs> Human feet have never touched that piece of ground. Wow. Yeah. Right? It, it, yeah, there's a big disconnect there. There's a disconnect there. Yeah. And I think that that actually, you know, I mean, some, some people have asked, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and, and make something happen that was going to drive change into our food systems, it sounds crazy, but if I could get everybody in the, in, around the world to walk into a prairie with bare feet um, and do that maybe on a regular basis, that connection would I think drive change yeah it would make people sane again I think so yeah and let's say that the somebody already came by with the magic wand and all the the trouble would would have uh, uh, been solved if the world didn't need saving and you personally didn't need money to take care of yourself and your family just curious what would you be doing I would be going out with a sweep net and looking at uh, insects and 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 learning about this beautiful world that I live in. Um, I would be taking care and watching the sheep. My gosh, I love being a shepherd. Um, uh, taking care of the bees and opening up those hives and feeling the life in those. Um, the chickens and the poultry here on the farm and, and describing their antics and writing it down all down as stories. Great. Yeah. It's great that you, uh, you really live from this curiosity and this uh, sort of love for life. Uh, yeah. And, and not just a fear of uh, what the future is going to bring or. It really isn't a fearful thing. Uh, you know, farmers ask, uh, you know, how do I know if I'm doing things right? You know, what's the test? Right? Is it is it soil chemistry? You know, what is it? Is it the physical properties? How many microbes I have? I'm like, no. You you know how you know is every day you should walk out on your farm and you should see something you've never seen before. If you do that, you're doing things right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a beautiful one to to close off with. Um, I want to thank you a lot for your time and uh, and sharing all your experience with us um oh my pleasure yeah thanks for having me and giving this a little space